Hi, this is a video to show off one batch. Uh, this is a new system for uh, combining materials uh, so that rather than having uh, lots of different materials in your scene, you can have one material that uses one shader and uh, still preserves all those settings. Uh, it's designed to work with the standard shader. It works with either the specular or the um, uh, metallic workflow. Uh, and it supports uh, everything that the standard shader uh, supports. Uh, you can write custom shaders for it, uh, but the layout that it's looking for in terms of uh, extracting data uh, is from the standard shader. Uh, and for now, that's sort of the, the targeted workflow. I might get it more into uh, custom shader stuff uh, in the future, uh, but there's, um, you have to rewrite the shaders uh, to do that, and there's not a great automatic way to do that. Uh, so I'll see how much demand there is and what sort of feature spec that might look like. Um, so, uh, what the basic idea of this is, is to atlas all of these things together, uh, but not have the limitation of traditional atlasing. So if you've uh, used an atlasing tool or done it yourself, the basic idea is that you take some texture, you break it off into sections, and you map everything onto one texture sheet, right? So you have multiple objects using one texture, and then they can share the material. There's a lot of problems with that, though. You run out of texture resolution really fast, trying to pack it all in, uh, and you can't tile a texture. Uh, so you end up doing tricks like ping-ponging it in the UVs, but then that gets problematic for other reasons. Uh, so this doesn't suffer from those problems. Uh, it can actually use tiling textures, uh, and the textures can be large, and you can have lots of them. Um, so that's a big advantage. Uh, it does have some of its own restrictions, which I'll get into, um, but I think it's a neat technique, and it can really help reduce draw calls and set pass calls in your scene. So if you're suffering from that type of performance, uh, this can be a great optimization. And one of the really nice things about it is that you can do it very late in production. Um, basically, you can come into a level that's already been built uh, and, and look at what's there and use this tool to optimize it down. So that's really nice. So the way this works is that the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a config object. I'm going to delete my old one here. And what we do is right click, create, one batch, config. And we're just going to call this um, example. There's our example config. So what is a config? A config holds basically all the information about how these objects are combined and how to restore them back to their original state. It has a revert button as well. Um, and it also manages uh, property data uh, so that all the material attributes that you have for things like UV scale, uh, tint color, things, things like that, all get preserved uh, and still render correctly. So if we look at this scene, you'll notice we have a red sphere here that's got a tint color on it and we have a white one uh, next to it and uh, those have different values and that the normal uh, values, the normal strength has been changed on these two spheres. Um, so we have some variations using the uh, same mesh but with slightly different um, attributes. And then you'll notice this floor here is tiling as well as the, the wall. Um, so that sort of tests a bunch of cases for us. The other thing that this tests is that we're using a lot of the same meshes over and over uh, and the same materials and so uh, it has to um, be smart about that and uh, combine it in the most efficient way so that we don't duplicate texture data if we don't need to. So the first thing we need to do is we need to put all of the prefabs that we want to combine into this prefab list. Um, so what I'm going to do is lock the inspector by clicking the little lock up here so that I can select things freely and not uh, have it uh, change this window. And so I go to the prefab list here, and here's my list of prefabs. I grab them and I just drag them into here. Very simple. Um, so then we hit extract from prefabs. And what this is going to do is gather all those meshes and materials and uh, set everything up for us. So we're going to hit that and we can see all this uh, stuff appear. Uh, right below the extract button is the default texture compression settings. So here's the deal with the texture array. Uh, the texture array, every texture in it has to be the same size. So if I open this up, I'm going to see that the albedo array is going to be set to 1024 by 1024. Now it does not matter what size the input texture is, uh, the system will scale it uh, to match. Uh, but if you have um, you know, a bunch of different assets and some of them have really small textures and some of them really huge textures, you may want to combine all the small texture stuff into one, system, one uh, config and all the large texture stuff into another config uh, just to save uh, texture um, data. Uh, and the nice thing about this is it's very easy to rescale all your textures and change your options on all the textures at once because it doesn't really matter what the input is, uh, it's going to scale it here. 
And so finally, uh, we have this platform compression overrides. And what this is, is a per platform way to set up these uh, settings. So you can select a platform and you can basically say, hey, on WebGL, here's the settings I want to use. I want to use a lower size texture, um, you know, et cetera. And then when you're on WebGL, it will use those settings instead of the uh, default settings. So that lets you control everything um, from uh, sort of one place, which is nice. Uh, so we can get rid of that. We can go ahead and use that. Um, so let's extract from uh, the prefabs list here. Um, and there we go. We have our list. And so what this has done is uh, it's gone through everything and built up lists of the texture arrays it needs to build. You'll notice that I don't have all these maps assigned. Uh, my source uh, materials did not have a metal smoothness map. They didn't have a. They weren't specular workflow, so they didn't have a specular map. They didn't have a missive detail albedo, detail normal, or detail mask. Um, and so if it finds that hey, you don't have any of these things uh, on any of your materials, it's not going to bother to produce those arrays for you. Um, and uh, if you're using non-standard shaders, you know it might not pick up all of these. Uh, so you might have to fill some of these in. And then the other thing you'll notice is that it has a material count here. This is because the brick albedo and the stone albedo happen to have two vari it had you know a variation of each, right? We had a different material variation um, for each of these uh, and with some different values. But they can share the same textures. So it's going to make one entry for those for the textures and it's going to have um, two, a material ID so that it can produce two of its special uh, sort of materials uh, for this thing. So let's combine. We hit combine. And I have a bug right now. Let's see if we hit it. Yet yeah, we did. The first time you, you combine right now, uh, it doesn't uh, update correctly. Um, I have to fix that before I release. But if I just revert, it'll go back to the original shaders. And now if I combine again, um, it should fix it. I don't know why this happens. Nope didn't. I think it's a scene update thing actually. Let me just poke around and uh, where's my config again? My config. So you can see here it created the material for us. We can also unlock the inspector here. Ah, when I selected the material, it's, it's a refresh bug. It's suddenly updated. And so we can see that we have something that looks like the standard shader here on the material. Um, but it has this property texture. This is where all the per, per material settings are stored. And it has an albedo map, but this is actually a texture array it's looking for, not a traditional um, uh, texture. Um, it has a normal map, occlusion map, etc., but they're all texture arrays. Uh, and I'm actually going to remove these tiling and offsets because uh, they aren't used and the UV set. So this will be very stripped down soon, uh, where it's only about textures and where is that uh, metallic uh, source, and then the rendering mode. Of opaque or alpha. So those are, uh, you can think of everything here as global settings, right? If I change where this metallic alpha is, it's going to change it for all of these, um, all of these ma faked materials, right? Because you only have one material to store this data on, and so everything's shared. And all of the actual data that you normally have about tint and things is stored inside this little property texture, uh, which it sticks out um, here into the file. And you can see it's just an eight by six texture, so it's a tiny little thing. And it just holds all our data uh, for us so that we can sample it in the shader. Um, okay, so you don't have to worry about that too much because the system automatically hooked this all up for us. Um, and what you'll see here, if you go back to the config, is that now under each of those texture entries, we have our submaterials. And so if we look at that brick albedo again we, that had two materials, we see that it has a brick material and brick normal strength material because these were all the same except that the normal strength was 0.5 on this one and one on this one. So that's the difference between these two materials, right? And over here, we have one that has a tint and one without the tint. Um, and the smoothness is a little bit different. But we can come in here and we can change um, any of these values around. We can change our tint to be blue, and you can see it's tinting the wall there. Um, we can find a better example up here. We can change the tint on this one, which I think will affect one of the spheres. Or nope, that's the floor. Oh, of course, it's the tiles material. It says right there. Um, sometimes I don't pay attention to my own stuff. And then here we go on this brick material here. You can see we can change the spheres that we're using that material. So it's preserved all of those original materials that you see here. Um, 
all of these. It's reserved all those settings into this special texture. And if we actually look at any of these objects, you'll notice that they all use the one batch standard shader. <clears throat> and their material is an example shader that we set up, um, that the config created for us, because we called it example. And you can set your shader here too, but all of these objects use that same material. So they're all rendering in one material, okay? And um, if we uh, pl hit play on this thing, we can see that the draw calls are actually lower. So let's hit play now, and then we'll revert it. And so we can see here that we're doing this in nine batches. And uh, what is our set pass calls is nine. Um, so it's nice and low. And our batches is nine. Okay. Now let's switch over, let's just revert this config back to the way it was. So we can come down here, we're gonna hit revert. So now, if we look at these guys, there are all our original materials. We see this is the brick with a standard shader. And you can see that these are all different. We have stone, stone tint, etc. Now let's hit play. And we'll see that our draw calls on the before case were 32 batches with 32 set pass calls. Okay, so we went from 32 uh, set pass calls and, and, and batches to nine uh, by combining these. And on a large scene with a lot more stuff in it, this would have a much bigger effect, uh, especially if you combine more and more things into these lists. So let's combine it again. And again, it doesn't take that long. As you get larger lists, it does take a little while to pack the textures, um, but overall it works pretty fast. Um, and you can see the scene is you know pretty much exactly uh, like it looks. If I revert, you can see really no difference. We combine again. And boom. Um, so yeah. Um, okay, so here's, oh yeah, it reserved that tint color. That's why it looked a tiny bit different on that one object. If I turn off that tint, uh, then it is exactly like the original. Um, so yeah, uh, so that's basically how the system works. Um, and uh, also what it does is it, it actually, to do this, it has to make unique meshes for each material. So in this case, we have the cube, the quad, the sphere, and we have four of the spheres. Why do we have four of the spheres? Well, because we have four different material variations of the sphere. And so what you're trading off is that you can have unique meshes, um, and, uh, but now you don't have unique materials. Okay, so if you have lots of material variations, it's going to increase your mesh data, uh, which, you know, might be a problem if you have the same object thousands of times with slightly different material tweaks. Um, but uh, usually that's going to be a good trade off because you're actually going to help with your, your, your draw calls a lot. And uh, on top of this, um, usually it doesn't have to do this very often. Most of the time you have a bunch of unique materials and they're truly unique with unique textures and so it's not not really going to have to do this often. But it does support it in case you have uh, colored versions of things uh, statically in the scene. Okay, so we have everything um, created into this one mesh thing and the other downside I should talk about is that uh, when this gets loaded it's going to load uh, everything in these arrays uh, at once. So essentially um, it can't load a single texture and a single mesh. It's going to load all of them at once. So when you're combining these things, what you want to do is think about logical sets of your, your data. A lot of people use kit bashing. They buy stuff off the asset store. Sometimes you only use one thing from that asset pack. Maybe it's not best to combine that whole asset pack. Maybe you should take the one item that you uh, are using and put it in with some other ones. Uh, so you really kind of do want to sort your data. But the advantage is that um, it's good to do that anyway so that you know what you're using and uh, you're able to uh, combine all these things and greatly reduce the draw calls, um, which is pretty cool. Um, the last thing I want to show is um, there's an example here of a, um, a Amplify Shader Editor uh, custom shader. So let's say you don't want to use a standard shader. You want to scroll some UVs or do something uh, funky, a little different. Uh, this sample will show you how to, uh, how to do that with the one, uh, one batch system. And so what I did was I created uh, a couple functions here. There's a one batch texture index, which grabs the texture index from the mesh. Uh, and so what this does is uh, if you've not used a texture array, a texture array takes a UV coordinates and it takes an index of um, what texture to sample. 
in the array. Um, and so this will grab the texture index from the mesh for you. Uh, so then you can use it uh, to sample your um, albedo and normal, in this case, uh, texture arrays. And then the other thing, uh, if we come down here, is the one batch data node. And the one batch data node is what uh, essentially will sample all the little per text properties um, from your mesh and then give you your smoothness, your tint, your detail normal map scale, all of these things uh, that you might want to use. Um, so if you decide you know you want to scale that texture and, and, and have that scale used uh, from the editor, you can use this uh, normal map scale here or your parallax height, whatever values you want from the standard shader, you're able to, um, to, to get these over here. And you could get your own uh, too by um, just reusing these. Um, and in this case, all I do with it is I basically uh, sample an albedo normal texture. And in the case of the albedo, I multiply by the tint and go into the albedo. And then with normal, uh, I take the normal strength and I do an unpack scale normal function and go into the normal. So that will scale the normal strength uh, for you. And then um, the final thing I do is plug the emissive color in. Uh, just an example shader. And if you look at, um, the, this node is actually really simple, but the one batch shader node is, is uh, quite complex if you go in and look at that thing. Um, so it's actually pretty cheap overall. Uh, there's a little known thing about, uh, often people talk about sample counts with a GPU. Uh, but if you sample a texture and that texture is small, or you're sampling all right next to this, the current pixel that you just sampled, uh, it goes really, really fast. And so this takes advantage of that and extracts all that data for you. And uh, the compiler will actually remove, if you're not using some of this data, it will actually remove those calculations for you, uh, which is a great thing about shader compilers. Um, so anyway, let me close out of this. I think about that about covers it. Um, I'm including some documentation, as always. Um, and uh, yeah, I want to get this into beta soon um, and get some people using it. Uh, and hopefully you find it useful. Um, if you have questions, comments, or anything, the best place to reach me is always on the Unity forums. Uh, I'll be creating a thread uh, for this, and uh, hopefully I'll get some feedback. Um, another nice thing about this is that it can work in conjunction with other tools that reduce your draw counts. Um, so, you know, if you're using some dynamic system or something like that, like most of these systems have one fundamental problem, which is that they cannot combine uh, materials together. And so that's what this does. It allows you to combine materials together, uh, combine a lot of materials, up to 256 with up to 256 sets of textures at full resolution, uh, so that the GPU could treat those as if they're all one material, right? So anywhere where uh, having more materials is hurting you, uh, this can help. So yeah, I hope it's useful, um, and uh, I'll hopefully have this up on the asset store pretty soon. Thank you for listening.